Good morning. Thank you, Ben. Guys, I think we've got a pretty big treat today with our speaker. And if you'll just hang in there for the next 30, 45 minutes, this is a pretty boring topic. <laughs> I know that college football is something that's not very near and dear to this crowd. So just, you know, be courteous and, and do this guy a service and listen. But it's with great honor that we have John Stevenson here this morning. John is president and CEO of the College Football Hall of Fame. Um, as such, he's responsible for some of the broader efforts to construct, develop, operate the 94,000 square foot attraction known as the College Football Hall of Fame and the CFA experience, both of which reside in downtown Atlanta. Before the hall, John was a corporate attorney, Troutman Sanders, which he joined in 2000. He was named partner in 2007 and served as counsel to a number of clients in the hospitality, <coughs> sports, and, and entertainment industry. In 2009, he was retained by the Hall's project organizers to assist with efforts to move the Hall from its previous home in South Bend right here to Atlanta. John is an Atlanta native who holds undergraduate and law degrees from UGA and resides in Atlanta with his wife Megan and their two children, May and Jack. I'm sure with our new indoor practice facility, we will have even more representation down at your Hall in the ensuing years, but for the moment, we want to welcome you, John. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Zach, and thank you for having me here this morning. A lot of good friends in the room. I'm among my people here, UGA, Terry College of Business. Uh, thanks for letting a law student infiltrate the business school. Uh, my brother is a Terry graduate. I don't see him in here today, which I'm going to have to talk about him, talk about a little later with him. But uh, it's fun to be here. It's fun to talk about uh, this project in downtown Atlanta. Anybody been there yet? Okay, good. All right, see, I ask that every time. We get more and more hands up every time. Uh, it really is a spectacular new addition to our city and our state. And uh, I'm going to brag on it a lot today. And I can do that because I didn't design any of it. <laughs> and I didn't build any of it. Uh, about four years ago, gosh, it's almost four years ago now, Gary Stoken was here speaking to this group, Terry College Third Thursday, presenting to you the vision of this project. And uh, at the time, as Zach mentioned, I was a partner at Troutman Sanders, and one of my clients was this was this project. Um, so I, I was with Gary ever since that first phone call in 2009 um, to the National Football Foundation to negotiate this here from South Bend. Uh, instead of having it go to Dallas, which was the other option that the foundation was considering. And so uh, yeah, about eight months later, the, Gary and the board decided this project needed to kind of live on its own outside of the umbrella of the bowl. Um, and at that point, uh, they asked me to, to take it on. And um, so the rest is history, and here I am. It's, uh, it's been a blessing to be a part of the project as a native Atlantan, as a Georgia guy. I just am really, really proud of what we've got down there, and I hope that at the end of this, my goal is for you to also be proud of it as Georgians and as Atlantans because we've got a lot of good things going for us. You know, we Atlantans tend to walk around with this inferiority complex. You know, we're not a good sports town. We can't have nice things and, you know, and, uh, but, but, uh, but that's not the case. I mean, there's, uh, it, 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 I know all of you just raised your hand about who's been to the Hall of Fame. Who's been downtown to Centennial Olympic Park just to kill a Saturday recently? Okay, good. Excellent, excellent. I mean, I wouldn't have raised my hand uh, before I started working down there to that question, I'll admit. But it's a pretty special place down there. You go down there and you've got this amazing mix of attractions. You've got this you got streetcar now, you've got this Ferris wheel. I mean, it's sometimes I bring people down there and they're like, well, when did all this happen? I'm like, what city am I in now? It's really, it's really quite special. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, if you hadn't, if you've been there, this is a review for you, um, but you can testify to it as well. If you haven't been there, I'll give you a little glimpse into it, give you a little bit about the, the history and the business aspects of it, and then just answer your questions and keep it light. Hopefully that uh, since our, maybe our brains aren't working well with this weather, this cold weather yet, um, keep it light and hopefully again, leave here with a good sense of pride about this project. So I mentioned the National Football Foundation. Uh, this is the only boring slide I've got up there, I hope anyway. Um, the, uh, the National Football Foundation is a long-standing ent entity that owns the Hall of Fame as an intellectual property. So they started the Hall of Fame back in the 50s. Uh, they've been naming the Hall of Fame classes ever since. They continue to do that. Uh, their chairman is Archie Manning. They have a board that reads like, you know, uh, football and business royalty. 
uh, very powerful board, um, and they are kind of the guardians of amateur football. They have the Hall of Fame. They have a scholar athlete uh, program where they name a scholar athlete class every year from uh, current college players. They give one of those players the Campbell Trophy, which some call the Academic Heisman. They have um, 121 chapters uh, nationally. Two of the largest are Atlanta, Touchdown Club of Atlanta, and the Athens uh, Touchdown Club. Uh, and we just simply hold a license from them to display the Hall of Fame in our building and all the stuff they've collected over the years. They've got about six or 700 pieces of memorabilia, really cool artifacts, large and small. Uh, I'm sorry, they have, we have about six or 700 on display in the building right now. That's about a fifth of the total collection. And so all that collection is here in Atlanta in the Congress Center in an archive room um, that will remain undisclosed location. Um, but uh, uh, we have a, hold a license from them. Atlanta Hall Management is a Georgia company. We formed it specifically just to do this, to hold that license, to raise the money for the building and to operate the attraction. And that's the company that, that I'm fortunate enough to, to head right now. We've got about 50 employees, about 30 in the building, a little less than that in our corporate offices, which are in the Congress Center. Um, and we've got a great, great thing going down there. So why did they come to Atlanta? Uh, you know, the negotiation really was just about the terms, you know, what, what, how, what, what's going to happen when you come down here. In my mind, even though they, they did talk to Dallas, I don't think there was ever a doubt in the National Football Foundation's mind that Atlanta was the place to put this. Um, uh, this is a couple of highlights that many of us Atlantans uh, don't really appreciate. ESPN calls us the king of college football here. Um, Atlanta reaches a milestone with 40 million visitors in 2012. I believe that was 45 million last year. Uh, and then my favorite, this uh, New York Times headline. This is the New York Times beginning of 2014. It said, the 52 places to go in 2014. Now, this is in the world, not in the U.S. 52 places to visit. New York Times, 52 places to visit in 2014. Downtown Atlanta is one of eight U.S. cities on that list. Not Atlanta, downtown Atlanta, citing all the stuff that's going on down there. So that's a real point of pride that a lot of us miss. Uh, but the tourists don't. Um, so we need to start pounding our chest a little bit about that. Also the location. So the old model of a Cooperstown or a Canton or a South Bend of building an attraction like this with public dollars in an effort to draw tourism to their city is the exact opposite of what we've done here. We've used private dollars to put this attraction right in the middle of an already very active tourism and business travel district. Right? So our site is that yellow highlighted piece right there in the middle. You can see Centennial Olympic Park right next to it, uh, <coughs> right there. To the north side of the park, of course, you've got the world of Coca-Cola, the Georgia Aquarium, and the new Center for Civil and Human Rights. Uh, to our south, we have CNN Center and the Phillips Arena. To our west, we have the Georgia World Congress Center. And you don't get a sense of how big that building really is until you look at a picture like this. This is building A and B. Building C is off the page. You can't even see it. Uh, and then uh, Phillips Arena and the Georgia Dome. Of course, the new Falcon Stadium is currently under construction. If you've driven downtown, you've seen it. It's going right next door, just to the south. When that's done and the dome is gone, you won't even hardly be able to tell that it moved. Um, and again, you go down there, it's, it's coming out of the ground quickly, and it'll be ready in 2017. Of course, you've got the Peachtree Street Corridor there to the extreme right of the page. Um, you've got about 2 million people going to the World of Coke every year, stabilized, about a million going to the, uh, excuse me, a million going to World of Coke, 2 million going to the aquarium. Uh, a couple three million going to the park, hundreds of thousands of football fans going to the Georgia Dome. So this is why this works here. Uh, it, it, there's not a site like this anywhere else in the country where all this is there, particularly for a football thing. So NASCAR Hall of Fame in Charlotte, Canton Pro Football Hall of Fame, Cooperstown Pro Baseball, they're nowhere near a venue that actually plays the sport on a regular basis. And South Bend's near Notre Dame, but it's not, but you can't walk there. It's in downtown South Bend. Uh, the Georgia Dome, of course, has an excellent football resume with the SEC championship game, Chick-fil-A kickoff game, Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, Black College Football Classic, Falcons, Georgia State, high school playoffs. Um, and just up the road, I believe there's a school that plays football as well, about 10 blocks more. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but uh, it, it's just a fantastic location for an attraction like this. Uh, if you were going to pick a 2.7 acre site, anywhere in the country to put a college football themed attraction, I would challenge you to find a better 2.7 acre site 
in the country for it. So uh, you know, we've uh, got, got a great cooperation from everywhere, everybody around us down there, the professional courtesy extended to us by the other attractions, by the Congress Center, uh, by Phillips, by the Falcons. Um, it's just been tremendous. Everybody's pulling on the same oar down there. It is really a, a group effort to really establish this as a world-class destination because it is. I don't know if anybody was down, down there for the Final Four in 2013. Um, but if you were, I mean, it was Chamber of Commerce weather every day. They had three concerts in the park, three nights in a row, 50,000 people in the park every night. There wasn't a single incident. It was a great vibe. All the venues are right there. All the hotels are right there. It's something to be proud of. Um, of course, the new Falcon Stadium is opening in 2017. Uh, we, we being Atlanta, have already secured uh, the Final Four, NCAA Final Four for 2020. And I know they're bidding on Super Bowl and college national championship game for a, a, you know, 18, 19, 21, 22, somewhere around those, those years. So a lot of good stuff ahead of us uh, down here as well. So I use the word attraction very intentionally. Um, it is an attraction. It is a, an attraction with a Hall of Fame in it. That's how you need to think of it. Um, whatever you think of in your mind as a, as a Hall of Fame, uh, that is not what we have downtown. It is an attraction that is appealing to uh, people of all ages and of all levels of football fandom. Uh, and you'll see a little bit of that in here. This is the site that we were on. Uh, what site used to look like, remember it was the old green lot of the Georgia World Congress Center. Uh, surface lot, about 100 uh, uh, spaces. That's the Omni Hotel's North Tower there to the left. Stats up there to the top right and building A of the Congress Center uh, there to the, to the top of the page. So we've used up the whole site. This is what it looks like now. You can see at the north end of the site there, we built a parking deck. So the parking deck has about triple the spaces that were in the old green lot. And the state continues to own and operate that lot. So the state of Georgia is making more money on this site than they were before we got there, even though we built a 90,000 square foot building on it. Uh, there's also a uh, piece of the project right here between our front door and the Omni, that little tunnel looking thing. Uh, we call that the connector because you remember if you were to walk from the park up into the plaza to go to a, the Georgia Dome, you'd have walked up a set of stairs that were outdoors right next to the Omni Hotel. Well, that walk now is totally enclosed all the way down to Marietta Street, all the way up into Building A. And the Omni Hotel also is hooked into it. So now you can walk from Marietta Street or from our building through all three buildings of the Congress Center to the Georgia Dome, through both Omni Towers, through CNN Center, through Phillips Arena, without ever going outside. So the whole complex is connected down there. Another state element of the project that we built and is now owned by the state. Our building is in the middle. Again, it's about 90,000 square feet. Um, it's a pretty basic building. It's a big box with lots of cool stuff in it. There is this architectural feature here that some people think looks like a helmet. Some people think it looks like a football. Take your pick. Our architects are just tickled to death that it's a debate because it means it's adequately abstract. <laughs> And, uh, and they are artists, so they dig that pretty hard. So let's talk about the building. Uh, we had a great opening day on August 23rd, 2014, about six months ago. Seems like about six minutes ago. Um, we turfed Marietta Street. All of Marietta Street had artificial turf on it. We had a big crowd out front, and the mayor came and kind of opened it up for us. So the second you walk in the building, you realize you're in a place that's not what you're expecting. This is our lobby. This is a three-story atrium. This is our helmet wall, creatively named. It's a wall of helmets. Um, it's about 60 feet tall and 40 feet wide, and it's got a full-size football helmet of every school in the entire country, all divisions. So for two tickets to the College of Wall of Fame, not if you've been there before, sorry. How many helmets is that? How many schools play football in the U.S.? Four-year colleges. I'll take three answers. Closest one gets the tickets. Yes, sir. 728, good guess. 710. 710, another good guess. Yes, sir. 330. 330, no, it's 768. Sir, here are your tickets. That's it. Uh, 768 schools. There are actually 818 helmets up there. There's 50 placeholders. Uh, they're just dummy helmets so that as schools add football, we can take them out and put their helmet in. They're also random in order for a couple reasons. We don't want people coming in saying, why is my helmet up there and not down here, which they do anyway. Uh, but now our answer can be honestly bad luck. Sorry, luck of the draw. It was luck of the draw. Um, 
They're also not organized by conference or alphabetized because as you add and subtract schools, you got to shuffle them. You would have to shuffle them up. Um, you come into our lobby, you get a ticket like this. It hangs around your neck. Uh, it's got an RFID chip in it, a radio frequency chip. That's technology that's been used a lot with inventory and manufacturing. Not brand new technology, but cool technology if you use it right, which we do. Um, you come into our lobby, you register with us, give us your name, your email, and the school that you affiliate yourself with. Every helmet has a spotlight shining on it, and it has a blue light in the ear hole. So as soon as you tell us that you're a Georgia fan, that Georgia helmet lights up really bright, starts blinking, and the ear hole lights up so you can find it easily. And then it settles down into a nice blue light in the ear hole, and so at the end of the day, uh, you can tell where everybody's come from. It stays lit all day long. Um, thought I had a better helmet picture in there. Uh, the, uh, the helmets, this is the, after the first day we'd open, we turn off the lights to see all the helmets, and it's really cool. So you can go in there in the lobby and see where everybody's come from on any given day. Um, after you've done that now, your ticket knows your name, and it knows that you're a fan of that school. And that follows you throughout the building. If that kind of creeps you out, then, then don't do it. <laughs> but, but you should do it, because that's the, really the magic of the building. You go, and every screen you walk by, every interactive that you encounter welcomes you by name with your school's logo. And there are certain things you can do in the building and take away from the building that also go through your tag here. Our, uh, one of the great surprises we've had on this is our exhibit designers told us to expect about a 20 to 30 percent capture rate on people volunteering, particularly their email information, to you like this. Um, and we are currently sitting at 88 percent of visitors that come in and, and engage us like this, which is great. So now we know, you know that you were here, we know your email, and we know you're a fan of that school. So we're not going to pound you with a bunch of emails, but we have something cool happening uh, that's relevant to your school, then we can email you and say, hey, you might want to come back and see this. Um, opposite the helmet wall, we have a nice big mural by Steve Penley, a uh, big uh, mashup of his uh, football images. He's a big football fan. Uh, Y'all Georgia fans, that's why I put it in here. You know, he, you know him pretty well. Um, had to pump the brakes on a little bit to not put too much Georgia in there, but it's, uh, you know, he's an artist, so he can do what he wants to do. Uh, that's 36 feet by, by 40 feet. It's 36 uh, five by six panels that are that fit together in a in a, in a mural. He calls it his, he calls it his Sistine Chapel. Um, the lobby is also a great event space. The building was designed to be as much as an event space as an exhibit space because of where we are. We know there's high demand for unique event venue down there, like the aquarium does it so well. So our building is designed to be an event venue as well. Another nice surprise we've had is the event business. Now we're the new thing in town and, and people want to see us, but we kind of modeled for about 50 events per year just because we had no idea how many people were going to come in here. And I think the one tonight is going to be our 102nd since August. Uh, so that's, that's, that's good. Um, Omni is our exclusive caterer, thank God, because they, they flip this building and serve the food and put the bars out there and the buffets out there every night. Same people every night. So they've got it down to a science. And if it was you know, three or four different caterers coming in there every week. It'd be a it'd be a mess. But we've got we've got it down. It's a great venue, um, very flexible. The lobby will hold about uh, 300 people in this kind of stand up cocktail setting, in a sit down setting. It's you know 100. This 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 crowd in here would would fit very well in there. Uh, when you go upstairs, our exhibitry is always a mix between the historic kind of physical museum quality pieces you would expect to see in a museum matched up with some great uh, media and software ways to engage with college football that are completely new, never been seen before. Uh, in this big trophy case in the middle, you see the Heisman Trophy, you see the six major bowl trophies, of which the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl is now one of. Um, you see uh, other championship trophies, major awards, and the new national championship trophy. So again, this is the only place you can see an exact replica Heisman and, and new national championship trophy. But behind it, you've got this wonderful 52-foot-long media wall. And these boxes that you see on the wall kind of phase in and out like this. It's very active. Um, and they are thumbnails, essentially, of photo and video. It's pulling from about 10,000 assets in our content management system. Uh, and so if you were an Auburn fan and you saw that Auburn button or, or thumbnail, you would touch that and you would have your own workspace then with just Auburn stuff to look at. Now, if you've registered as an Auburn fan, right, and it's on your tag, just by approaching the wall, 
after you get about three feet in front of it, it automatically gives you your, your own workspace uh, with on, only Auburn stuff to look at. And the more you play with the wall, the more it learns what you're trying to look for. So it's going to offer you more Auburn stuff, more SEC stuff, pictures of tigers, um, uh, this kind of thing. And it's a really cool uh, feature. It's un unlimited multi-touch um, interactive. It's actually not touch screens. There are lasers in the top box there that map the whole wall. So you really don't have to touch it. You just have to get close to, close enough to it where you feel like you're touching it. Um, custom piece made for us in San Francisco by a company called Obscura Digital. Um, the rest of the uh, exhibits uh, on the second floor, again, we're not in the Hall of Fame yet. This is just a big college football celebration that goes all around the second floor. You've got some um, museum, museum pieces scattered throughout. That's our mascots case. Of course, we have ugly shirt there. Um, and then in this gallery, you have a number of interactives um, on the edges that are, that are cool games to play. So in this one in particular, this is all about fans gaming. This is mascots, tailgating, cheerleading, uh, bands, traditions. And so in here, you have the time-honored tradition of fight song karaoke, for instance, <laughs> and uh, digital face painting, where it takes a picture of your face and you get to paint it with your fingers. Um, and all that stuff that you do in there downloads to your tag. Um, so you go to our website, put in the number on the back of this ticket, <clears throat> and all the stuff that you do in there like that uh, is saved there for you to collect and share, and there's no upcharge for any of that. We want to encourage people to share from our building because you really have to be there to understand what it is. It's so different than what you think. It's hard to advertise it. It's hard to say, oh, this is like coming here because it's not like going anywhere. It's all brand new. So very important for people to sample our building. That's why I'm sitting here giving out tickets. And to, and to share what they do in our building with their spheres of influence and to say, you got to go try this thing out because it'll blow your mind. Uh, this will blow your mind. This is our theater, um, the 150-seat theater. It's 40 feet by 10 feet. This screen is Ultra HD or 4K. You might have seen these TVs advertised. Some of them are curved. They call them 4K because it's 4,000 pixels instead of 1080. So it's kind of like the new generation of HD TV. But when, like when HD TV came out, it's a race between the hardware and the content. If you were an early adapter on HD TV and you went to Costco and spent $5,000 on an HD TV, you get it home, there's no HD content to watch on it, right? So it's like, well, how long am I going to wait? Well, that's going on now with Ultra HD. Uh, ESPN, ABC, all the broadcast outlets aren't filming with that H Ultra HD camera yet because not enough people have the televisions yet. Uh, this is 4K Ultra HD. We've been filming with our own HD, Ultra HD camera for the last three years. Our production company has uh, at about 30 different games to go into this film. It's a 10-minute film called The Game of Your Life. It's incredible footage. You can testify to it if you've seen it. And you're narrating, you're narrated to by Hall of Famers. So again, a marriage between very new, can't see anywhere else unless you're inside our building imagery, uh, and a good dose of history as well. This is also an event space. You can do... Uh, programs in here. You can watch a live game in here. You can do a presentation in here. We had an interesting one the other day. I don't know if anybody's seen the advertisement for the show on ESPN called Snoop and Son. I know Zach's a big Snoop Dogg fan. Um, and so his son apparently is a college football prospect. And uh, he, there's a show on ESPN that documents this father-son story. Uh, and they called us and uh, asked us if we could screen the first two episodes for the media in our theater um, and we said sure as long as Snoop comes and we can do a little Q&A with him which we did this is him doing his Q&A up there and then we can walk him around the building so and this was a great opportunity for us because it brought a lot of media in there that aren't necessarily sports media they're entertainment media and it really exposed the building to a lot of different um, people that would not have been in the building otherwise and they kind of saw the building and said wow this is really even if I'm not a football fan I could really have a good time in here and that's the point some of our favorite reviews are from people that say in their review, I am not a football fan. And I got drug here kicking and screaming by whoever. And I knew I was going to have a terrible time, and it's two hours later, and I'm having the time of my life just because it's entertaining, it's engaging, it's new, it's different. Different things happen in here. That's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, so you get results like this with Snoop Dogg kicking a field goal in, in a suit. Um, if you want to see whether he made it or not, I would highly recommend going to our YouTube channel and picking up Snoop Dogg's visit to the Hall of Fame. He's a quite, quite, quite an interesting fella. 
Uh, even in our Hall of Fame exhibit, the Hall of Fame exhibit is about uh, uh, 5,000 square feet of this 90,000 square feet. And that's not to diminish the importance of the Hall of Fame. It is our authenticator. It's what makes us unique. Uh, but it is a part of the entire attraction. It's kind of the, 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 the pinnacle experience. But uh, it's just kind of the cherry on top because, again, it's got to be appealing to, to everybody. The College Football Hall of Fame has about 1,000 members in it. And even that is a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of people that have played college football. I mean, millions of people have played college football as opposed to pro football. So it's hard to have a Hall of Fame that can be appealing to everybody, uh, which is why our exhibit designers and their wisdom said, let's make the building about college football in general first and, it, and get people engaged through their passion for their school. All right, that helmet wall. You light your helmet up on the wall right as you walk in the door. All right, I'm in. Doesn't matter if I really care who wins the games on Saturday, but I made my helmet light up, right? So I'm, I'm engaged now. And then you celebrate the entirety of college football on the second floor, and then the third floor is this Hall of Fame. These are what the plaques looked like in South Bend. They were about 12 by 12. They were arranged all around the, the building uh, in kind of a timeline fashion. Um, the only problem with your building being a timeline is time continues. And so if you're not prepared to have your building continue, then you might want to rethink that. So we did. We gave our, our uh, exhibit designers a blank sheet of paper and said, and the National Football Foundation, keep in mind, this was a big step for them, said, forget everything you know about a Hall of Fame. What would you do if you were starting from scratch? And so what they've done is gotten rid of the plaques, and then the Hall of Fame room, which is up on the top floor there with that window that looks out over the park, uh, it's the nicest room in the building. It's stone on the floor. It's wood on the wall. It's like a cathedral in there. And around the room, they have the Hall of Famers etched into these big glass panels. Their name, their school, the position they play. So that's their permanent presence in the building. In the middle of the room, of course, though, now you've got these, and, and, and Gary mentioned these in his talk, you've got these big, uh, about six-foot-tall screens. And you approach these screens again. If you're a Georgia fan, you would walk up to this screen, and it would welcome you by name and give you a big Georgia G and show you all of the Georgia Hall of Famers on that screen without you even touching anything, just by you being in the room. And then if you wanted to engage one of the Hall of Famers, you would touch on your Hall of Famer, and then he would fill the screen. You'd have his data, his biography, and you also have media, highlights, interviews, photos, whatever we can put into our content management system. So you're getting a much deeper dive on these Hall of Famers than you would be if you were just looking at a plaque. And you get people engaging with it. I mean, you get kids looking at these things because it's fun. And, and they spend a lot more time in this hall than they would in a hall with just static exhibits. Um, so there's 1,000 people in here for the next two tickets. You might know how many Hall of Famers Georgia has? Players. Nine. Nine? Nope. Five. Five. Fourteen. Fourteen. The answer is 12. So those are for you back there. Um, you can come get them later. Can you name them? Can you name them? <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. He's a coach. He's a coach, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yep. Um, Trippy. I wrote him down. I admit, I wrote him down. <laughs> Trippy, Sinkwich, Tarkenton, Bill Stanfield, Kevin Butler, the only kicker in the Hall of Fame, Jake Scott. So we got a pretty proud truth. And Bill Hartman. Other piece of trivia for Georgia fans. What's the only school that has three Super Bowl MVP graduates? Georgia. Name them. Scott, Terrell Davis, Heinz Ward. There you go. Okay, back to the presentation. Uh, so these, these, uh, these, uh, these, these screens are really cool. They're full of content. They're full of, uh, full of uh, 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 video and, and, and photos. And we can add to them all the time. So this, this uh, exhibit continues to evolve. Our building, our guarantee is you're going to see something in there in your second visit that you didn't see in your first visit. So that's important for an attraction to always be new, always be fresh. And with these screens, we can really do that. Again, it's a beautiful big room. Got that big window looking out over the park right there. And those screens overhead play a kind of really slow 
just kind of back and forth of Hall of Famers in a random fashion, except it's not so random. Um, we have antennas in this room also reading everybody that's in the room right now, and they queue up. We queue up those schools, Hall of Famers, to go above on the screen, so you feel like you're getting lucky when you look up and you see a Georgia player. Um, it's not, not, not by accident. Nothing's by accident in our building. So it really is a spectacular room, and the Hall of Famers themselves are really pleased with it. And so that's the important thing for us, is that they feel adequately honored in here, even though we've, we've tricked it up a little bit and kind of brought it into, into the modern age. But uh, they enjoy people being able to go see them, not just a, a, a piece of plaster that might look like them. Of course, we have plenty of artifacts in there. We do have a lot of technology. We have a lot of you know, hardcore, what you would want to see in a museum. This is our big history of the uniform exhibit case. Some really cool things in there, uh, going back all the way to the 1800s and evolving up to now. That number 62 right there is Charlie Trippy's jersey, actually. Um, but we're very even-handed with uh, the schools and all our exhibits. We go uh, border to border and coast to coast, as uh, Steve Hatchell at the NFF likes to say. Uh, we were very intentional about being even-handed, making sure we had all the conferences represented, all the schools represented somewhere, uh, and all sizes of school all across the conferences. Because uh, it, is, it is not just the, the SEC Hall of Fame, although we would, you know, we could probably fill the building with that alone. Um, really nice service academy feature. And then the centerpiece of our building is the field. Um, it's a 45 yard long indoor football field. Uh, that's a 36 foot by 18 foot HD screen, not ultra HD, uh, up on the wall there. And uh, this is kind of where everybody gathers and has some refreshments and, uh, and watches some highlights and also just does some physical activities. So you see we've got the skill zone set up here which consists of a full-size field goal kick. Uh, you get to run through, the, run through the dummies, you get to throw some passes. Our fan ambassadors are out there helping uh, kids like this and, and big kids uh, like Zach uh, go through this obstacle course. Uh, we always take an over-under every day on how many hamstrings are going to be left out there on the, on the field. Um, that number goes higher if we have a corporate event that night. Um, <laughs> that has an open bar, then it's very high. Um, but it's a fun place to be, and uh, it's also our main event space. So all that, all that, all that field activity that I, that I showed you down there on those nets, that all disappears in about 25 minutes, and the Omni comes out, and we set up this thing for a banquet. And it's a unique space, right? But it's designed, again, it's designed specifically to be an event space more so than even a, a physical activity place. The, the carpet is carpet. It's not turf. It looks like turf. kind of feels turfy. It's like an artificial putting green kind of. Um, so you can walk on it with loafers and high heels. The tables don't bother it. It's easy to clean. Um, and we can really nice it up in there. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the ACVB's um, Hospitality Hall of Fame Awards that were there. Had about 500 people seated. Full banquet service stage up at the front and their own AV up on that big screen. Um, this is the welcome dinner for the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. We had the TCU Horn Frogs on the left side of the room and the Ole Miss Rebels on the right side of the room and a barrier between them that would not even stand a chance if there were an incident, but luckily there wasn't. Uh, we fed them, had, a, made, had them a good time with them. We got them to send us, name us, their two best Xbox football players. And so they sat up there and played each other in, in Madden on the Xbox, and we threw it up on the big screen so everybody could watch it. And that produced a lot of, uh, a lot of noise uh, when those guys scored at touchdowns. Um, this is about 1,300 people seated in a theater style, uh, again, with a stage and AV up at the front. Uh, the building is really flexible. It, it, it turns into a lot of different things. This is a game-watching party that Cumulus had for the NFC Championship game. They had a contest across all their FM stations where you could win a ticket to come watch the NFC Championship game on the field. We had bars and buffets set up down there, watch the game on the big screen. After the game was over, they flipped it into a rock concert with Fall Out Boy, Palmer's favorite band, Fall Out Boy. Um, so the building is very flexible, uh, and the people that are in charge of the building uh, have been around these facilities before, and they independently have said, this thing really, really turns into a lot of different stuff quite easily, uh, which is great because um, that's an important part of our business model. It's also wired for broadcast. We had uh, ESPN um, is, a, is a good partner. We're not exclusive to ESPN by any means, but Burke Magnus, who's in charge of their programming, is on our board, our Atlanta board here. And he had their facilities folks come, and while we were finalizing the architect's drawings, 
uh, had them tell us where they would want to have their fiber and their panels to plug their cameras into, where their camera shots would be if they were doing a, a, a full-blown a full production on the field or in the lobby or somewhere. So we've got this fiber and, and camera positions sticking out everywhere in the building and a big fiber plug in the back of the building so their production truck can come and plug in and go straight to Bristol or wherever they're going without, a, without the need for the satellite. And so it's literally plug and play. And we want to encourage that because, again, we want people to see our building on their televisions and then so they'll come and visit us. First day of college football season, uh, last year we had uh, College Football Live here with uh, Scott Van Pelt and Brian Greasy and Mark May. Uh, they broadcast from the field all, all day long. Um, had the visitors. It was cool because the visitors, visitors could come and kind of engage with them, be behind them, watch them, watch them produce a show like that. It's kind of see, fun, fun to see that happening. Good advantage for our guests. We had Colin Cowherd come and do his nationally syndicated radio show, which is also a TV show. Feinbaum has been in there. Um, it's a really fun place to be for these guys. It's just different. And for a very highly produced production, like this was our uh, building dedication ceremony, you can see all the, all the uh, lighting and trusses they flew up there uh, to do, the, do a live television show. This is on ESPNU. Um, and uh, so we graduated from ESPN3, which is just online, for our first enshrinement ceremony in 2003. This is on ESPNU, which is pretty good. It's been about 100 million homes. Uh, and the great news is that next year, I don't know if you read this, but one of the things that I'm particularly proud of that our team has accomplished is that the end of the year college football award show, where they give away every major college football award except the Heisman, has traditionally been shown live from Disney World uh, the Thursday before the Heisman. So you've got you know three, uh, ten, about 10 awards given, three uh, nominees for each award. They're all there. Uh, all the ESPN talents there. It's broadcast live on ESPN1. Um, starting this December, that is going to be done from this field, not Disney World anymore. So for Atlanta to be able to take something uh, from Disney, which is the parent company of ESPN, by the way, um, and have them have enough faith in us and our building to do that production from our, our field here in, in December of 2015 and forever is really something we can be proud of. Um, we have a mascot. His name is Fumbles. Um, you know, we have, to, we have to constantly remind people this is a very different place. This is not what you, you don't expect the Hall of Fame to have a mascot with a goalpost for ears. But we have them. All right, so Fumbles is there. This is him with, on, opening, on opening day with the Kennesaw State cheerleaders. Uh, this is him on the field with, uh, with Kid. He's, he's usually around, you know, messing something up. Um, he's really good with the kids. You know, kids love him. This is a kid-friendly place. It's a very kid-friendly. It's almost, it's almost more for the kids than, than, for, the, than for, the, for the big kids. And that's something, that, again, that is going to take a while for people to kind of realize that, okay, this isn't a – dark old dusty hall with you know stuff I can't touch this is this thing's bulletproof it's made for people to come and have fun because college football is fun and that's what our building is all about every day uh, fumbles did get invited to participate in the tool race at the Braves game if you've ever been to a Braves game you see the Home Depot tools race around the warning track um, and so he was invited to participate in that apparently we found out after the fact that the deal is that this is sort of an initiation for mascots in Atlanta, and he got just beat to a pulp by these tools. <laughs> um, but uh, but <laughs> but our guy that, that's inside, he was he was prepared for it. Um, but uh, well, I don't know if he was prepared for what really happened. But anyway, it was good exposure for us to have fumbles there floundering on the field um, behind the tools. So uh, it, again, it's a very different place. It's a lot of fun. Um, there's you know, we could go on and on and on about it, but you got to be down there to understand it. The people that have been there will tell you it's you kind of have to go walk into the doors. I can show you all these pictures, but you got to go check it out, and I hope that you will. Um, I've got a quick little video that shows um, some uh, some of the inside, and then I'll I'll stop talking and and uh, I can answer some questions. Hopefully, this will work. College Football Hall of Fame, what a great representation of this great American sport. Every college, every conference, every division represented here. The history, the present, and uh, 
uh, from performances, still photographs, video, uh, surround sound. It's a tremendous experience. I would encourage all people interested in college football or football generally to come and see it because it uh, exceeded my expectations. Everyone's represented and uh, the stories of the games, the stories of the people, and the stories of the life lessons that are taught by the sport are all here on display. Greetings from the newest jewel of college football. The Hall of Fame in downtown Atlanta. From the moment you walk in this remarkable building, which is brand spanking new. Um, I, was, I had the opportunity to spend extra time here yesterday, and I took that time. And I was so flabbergasted by this hall. And I'm not just saying that because I'm in it, because of college football. If you're any fan out there of any sport, NFL, college football, basketball, baseball, this is the most interactive and the most current Hall of Fame that's out there and the most fun. And I'm not just saying it because I'm here, it's just like so refreshing to see something like this and it's, it's exciting. And I, I called my wife, my daughter, I said the first thing we're doing in the off season, I'm bringing you guys here. Because you were at the Old one in South Bend, it was awesome. This one is off the charts. We expect probably to come back because like I said, I brought my son today, I'll bring my granddaughter, my grandson, my other family members, they all wanted to come. Uh, but yeah, I expect Pro will probably be here good dozen times a year at least. You know, it's completely different than what I expected. And I've been to a lot of Hall of Fames. I've been to the you know, NFL Hall of Hall Fame in Canton. Um, and the thing that jumps out to me about this place is it's so interactive. And it's, and it's taken into account the way that we socialize this day and age. Um, that we want information when we want it. Um, and we don't want information that we don't want, right? So as you go through here and you can get the information you want, you don't have to kind of search for it very long. It's very easy to, to walk through, and it's interactive and it engages you. And so you're learning about history, uh, but you're also doing it in a way that's a 21st century kind of way. Well, this Hall of Fame really makes Atlanta the capital of college football. But football teaches you that uh, you don't make a touchdown on every play, that you're going to get knocked down. You can't do it alone. It's very much a team sport. But when you get knocked down, you get up and you try again another way. And I think that's been sort of the spirit of the city of Atlanta. It's uh, the spirit of college football translated into people living together. People coming here for lots of reasons uh, will all profit by and be inspired by what uh, you all have done with this wonderful facility. And on behalf of citizens of Atlanta's past who never dreamed that something like this could happen, I want to thank you. To build a little bit on what Mayor Young just said, you know, I, I, I hope that you haven't taken this as just a pure advertisement to come see us. I hope that you will. But the point is, this is a this is a point of pride for the state and the city, as is that whole area down there. And we're just kind of the next step in the progression of that. We've taken up kind of one of the last blank spaces down there in the in the green lot to really make it um, a walkable. Um, you, you go down there and stay for three days and never lack for something to do. Um, you heard the guy that said, we're going to come back. That's why I have him in there. Uh, that's important for an attraction, to be able to have people come back. This isn't a bucket list thing, right? This is a regular thing that you're going to do when you have family in town, if you got a day off from school and nothing to do. Um, this is just going to be part of the Atlanta landscape uh, and it's going to sustain itself, which is important as well. Um, the building was built with, with private dollars, corporate dollars. Uh, we're, we have one more sponsorship, which is the field, uh, to sell. And as soon as we do that, the building will be completely paid for. Um, with active, active equity, which is important to us as well. Um, so uh, I hope that you'll be encouraged and proud of what we got down there and come see us soon. Thanks. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. John, what's the maximum seating capacity if you're doing tables? On the field? There? On the field? Yeah. Uh, maximum seating capacity if, 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 with the stage or just tables everywhere? Tables everywhere. Tables everywhere. You can get probably 700, 750 to 800 in there. Yeah. And if you have the stage? If you have the stage. Uh, the largest crowd we've had in there is about 550. You still have some room to grow there. So you could probably go 600. It depends on how you arrange it. Um, you know, without the round tables in there, you could do well over 1,500 in there. 
the most we've had in the building at one time is 2,500. That was a total buyout event, and they were just kind of everywhere in the building. But it wasn't, wasn't overly crowded. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. John, your, through, oh, John, your throughput compared to South Bend, uh, and you had projections in your pro forma to start off with. Kind of give us some numbers mm -hmm. of your throughput. Sure. Um, you know, it's hard to identify a trend yet. We're, 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 we opened at the end of hospitality season, of tourism season. Uh, but still, we've already done well more than South Bend would have done in a year. Um, and uh, and we're, we're, we're pleased with the, the take rate. The, it depends on the kind of day you're talking about. So a day like today, when nothing's going on down there, and kids are in school, and it's cold, and this is a slow month for all the attractions down there. So our slow days, it's modeled to be a slow day. It's slower than we want to be on a day like today. Our slow days are slower than slow. Right, we'll, we'll we'll have people in there, but just not as many as we want to in our model to trail the the Georgia, Georgia excuse me, the world of Coke, for instance, by about fifty percent, which would be good for us. Um, now the weekends, uh, the particularly the game weekends and during holiday season, we were at capacity every day. Um, so it, the challenge is, we're going to get the football fans that come to town. We figured out towards the end of the season how to talk to those fans. Uh, and get them in, and get a, get us on their schedule. Um, holiday season, Black Friday was our busiest day to date at the time. Just out of nowhere, no football going on, just people not doing anything, and it's their first chance to come down there. Uh, we were we were pleasantly surprised by that one. Um, so we'll we'll get those that low hanging fruit. We already have got it figured out. Not figured out, but people are coming. Yeah, and and January the thirtieth. I mean December the thirtieth, which was. You know, which was crazy because we were sitting there in, at 4.30 with about 1,500 people in the building at the, at the moment, about 300 people on the street, and we had an event starting at 6.30. So we were like, what are we going to do here? Um, <laughs> but it's a good problem to have. Uh, the challenge is getting the general awareness up that this is a thing to do in Atlanta, which we didn't do, admittedly, in the fall. We tried to get relevant to football fans really quickly, and we did. We were advertising on the SEC network. We had ESPN in there to tell the college football world generally that this is a legitimate part of the college football landscape and you need to know that right now. We're not going to you know, grow into that. We're, we're that right now. So that was great. We did that. But that doesn't translate into just the passer through Atlanta who's got a two-hour layover or who wants to skip a session at the convention. You know, what do I do? Concierge, what do I do? Well, I can go to the aquarium, World of Coke. You know, we're not in that conversation yet because we're, we're new. Yes, sir. My question is sort of like this. I presume you're keeping track of, uh, I presume you're keeping track of zip codes and uh, origins of where people are coming from. Yes. So what does your data say, and how does it maybe compare to other Hall of Fames if you benchmark? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to the, the, the data question. We haven't done that study yet, which we're doing, I think, next, next month on our first six months. Um, I would say that I would bet it trends exactly as the World of Coke and the Georgia Aquarium go, uh, which is more tourists than residents, probably 60, 40, 70, 30, somewhere in that range. We might skew heavily resident for our first six months because it's people like you that are going to see it because it's new in town. Uh, but I'll be interested to see that. But we anticipate our attendance model to mirror that of the other attractions down there because we are an attraction. And... Uh, we might have a little lift in the fall when the other attractions have slow periods because we're football. All right, we, have, we have football reasons for people to come in here. But we're not counting on that. We're, we have, it's a bell curve between Memorial Day and Labor Day. That's tourism season, which we haven't even encountered yet. So we're looking forward to that. Um, but if the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays and bowl season are an indication, we, will, we were trending right where we want to be. Uh, with, in, in comparison to those other attractions. So I, ex I would expect us to have a pretty busy spring and summer. Well, I haven't been yet, but I look forward to going. Um, there was an interesting article, uh, AJC, I don't remember a couple months ago, about a NFL player, Terry Lacan, uh, Lacan or something. Terry um, 
have y'all done anything with him so far as uh, some programs or something for some of the at-risk youth? Well, you know, that's, uh, that, that'd be up to Terry. He certainly could. If you'll miss the story, we have a, one of our fan ambassadors, which we, what we call the people that work in the building, uh, a gentleman named Terry LeCount. He was, uh, played quarterback at Florida. He was one of the first African-American quarterbacks in the SEC uh, back in the 70s. And then he went on to play in the NFL as a receiver um, for the Vikings and the 49ers. Um, his story was a personal interest story that the AJC did um, by a person that knew Terry very well, um, so it was handled very very well. But Terry, you know, hit some hard times after he retired from the NFL, um, picked himself back up, became a school teacher, and we got referred to him by, uh, by actually somebody through Gary. And so now, I mean, this, this is like this guy's idea. This is his calling, right? Because he's he's a, he's he's got the football chops. He can talk old school football with the best of them, but he also knows how to talk to a six year old because he was a first grade school teacher for however many years and he is one of our lead fan ambassadors he's in there every day uh first first guy in last guy out um and like all of them in there he's not going to have a good time unless you're having a good time uh, and he's going to make sure that uh that those kids have a lot of fun and get a little education as well i've seen him take kids off the field because kids stay on that field for an hour and he'll gather them up and i'll see him pointing up he'll, he'll make them go on little scavenger hunts to go find something go learn something and come report back to him before he lets them back out on the field um but you know it, it, to take to take that story um uh, his story and to and to help other folks that are at risk certainly could i mean uh, that would be up to up to terry but he, he could do it for sure he's a good guy y'all come see him Thank you so much for your uh, messaging. I was interested on kind of the sustainability of, of your financial plan. I, sure. You said you use private funds to obviously get it started, and yep. you've got another corporate gift you're trying to get out. With you guys or being individual, if you might want some yeah. other field. <laughs> <laughs> With you being a charitable organization, I mean, is it always going to be the throughput, the tickets that you're planning for operations, <clears throat> or are you still fundraising as well? Yes. Uh, the idea would be for the large, the, the, the big sponsors in there, that they're going to build the building. And then the building, the business is going to run itself. So that, that would be based on ticket sales, retail sales, events. We get a little share on the parking, um, and then other revenue sources. And if we hit our our goals attendance-wise, um, which we will, and then if we hit our goals events-wise, which we are far exceeding already, then the building will sustain itself. And as a nonprofit, whatever positive cash flow we make just goes back into the building. It just goes to refresh the attractions or do whatever needs to be done next. Uh, and I, th I think that's, that's, that's achievable. We will not stop fundraising. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities programming wise and otherwise for other sponsors and individuals to get on board and support what we do down here for either for Atlanta or because of the football messaging. Uh, we have a really cool education curriculum that we just launched. We go to our website and check it out. It's already been downloaded by about 200 schools. Uh, it's out there for free. It's already Georgia pre-qualified. Um, all that kind of stuff, we will continue to do fundraising around to support the operations, but the idea is not that we need third-party support annually to run the building. So it's a non-profit, but a for-profit model, but nobody's making a return on it. All the money we make just goes back into the building. So you guys have a lot of great content that's available in the building, and you talked about some other social media assets, the Snoop Doggy Dog. YouTube. <laughs> How are you guys using social media before and after folks come and visit the hall? Good question. So social media is obviously very important. It's a double-edged sword because people come to the building and they're either going, this place is great or this place is not great. And immediately that's the opinion held of our building of whoever that person can talk to. 500 people at a time potentially. Um, so we have designed the building to um, be shareable. Again, when you go to download your assets that you collect in there, whether you've done the radio call play or you've sat at the ESPN desk and made your, your prediction on the game or done your fight song karaoke or painted your face, all that stuff, when you go and you look at it on our webpage, it's got four little buttons down there. And it's Twitter, Facebook, you know, Instagram, or download and share. Um, so that's where we're, you know, social media, as I've learned, and I'm not a social media guy, I'm sure most of you are, but. You want your audience to generate itself and to, and to generate its own content. That's the stuff that goes viral and shareable. Stuff we push out, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting and it's cool and it promotes, promotes us, but the real way to maximize that is to get people to do it themselves. 
uh, and, and continue to build that audience. So the building is designed to encourage that. Anything else? Well, I'd like to leave you with one last little video if I can make it work. Maybe I might not be able to, but we'll see. Um, and uh, I think you all recognize this guy. This is Herschel Walker's visit to the College of All of them. That's his son that was with him. <laughs> Back third down on the eight. In trouble. Got a block behind him. Gonna throw on a run. Complete to the 25 to the 30. Lindsay stop 35 40. Lindsay stop 45 50. 45 40. Run Lindsay 25 20. 15 10. 5. Lindsay Scott. Lindsay Scott. Lindsay Scott. Coming here to the College Hall of Fame, uh, I was so impressed. I mean, I've heard so many great things about it. And now to get an opportunity to come to a place like this, and especially in the state of Georgia, I tell you what, I'm impressed. And uh, I know I'll be coming back because there's so much, uh, there's so much is interactive, different things that you can do. And, uh, and I had a great time. To all the Bulldog Nation, I would tell them, guys, if you want to see the Georgia history of football, and not just uh, all your Hall of Famers, or just college football. I tell you what, you ought to come out here to the College Hall of Fame, because you see what Georgia was all about, how they started, what happened, and then you get to see all the Hall of Famers there from the University of Georgia, and I guarantee you, you're gonna love it. So only in our building will you see Herschel Walker doing Munson over Lindsey Scott, so. <laughs> you're welcome, Georgia fans. Thanks for having me. <laughs>